So, hi everyone, uh, welcome to our ASIC seminar series. And today it's our great pleasure to have Dr. David Fisher with us. And so David is um, a lead scientist and research um, agriculture engineer and the USDA Agricultural Research Service Adaptive Cropping System Laboratory um, here in Bellsville, Maryland. And he got an interdisciplinary doctor degree uh, in plant biology and mechanical engineering from Rutgers University and in 2001. And during this time, he developed methodology to link mathematical crop models with applied control system theories for use in NASA's Advanced Life Support System program. His current research um, consists of over 25 years of hands-on experience working with um, economically important crops in laboratory and field city. The studies um, collect with uh, the development of novel conceptual and mathematical paradigms to explain how factors influencing plant production and one level of hierarchy scale up to the entire plant and larger special scales. He is an internationally recognized authority on agriculture system modeling, quantification of a biotic stress on crop growth and de development, and also the regional food security studies. He has, co he has authored and co-authored over 60 peer-reviewed publications and made over 70 presentations, um, many of which were at the invitation of international colleagues. And Dr. Fisher continues to provide leadership in national and international projects, including the agriculture model intercomparison and improvement project. So let's welcome the speaker. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, John. So uh, part of my job over the next 45, 40, 45 minutes or so is to kind of explain what John just read to you guys. And uh, I didn't realize when I made, uh, John let me pick the week for the seminar. I didn't realize it was right before Thanksgiving, so I also appreciate that we have a pretty full crowd. So I'll try to make this worth your time. So uh, yeah, the title for my talk is Exploring and Quantifying Crop Responses to Climate Factors at Different Plant Scales. And there's, there's basically three uh, kind of research themes we're going we're gonna to touch upon. Um, first one, and this is probably roughly half the talk, is looking at the influence of abiotic factors. And by abiotic, we're talking more about climate impacts or nitrogen or water as opposed to uh, biotic pasture disease. So we're looking at investigating empirically uh, the effect of abiotic factors on crop growth and development. And primarily for this talk, I'm focusing on experimental responses to CO2, temperature, and water availability. So I'll be using CTW uh, a lot through the talk. And then uh, another big part of my job is to take that information and quantify uh, crop responses using mathematical models. We develop different algorithms and we basically develop something that we call explanatory crop models. And for those who aren't familiar with what that means, I'll spend some time kind of midway through the talk and, and explain that in more detail. Uh, and, and basically the idea is taking this empirical knowledge and incorporating it into a process level tool that we can make predictions with. And then the last step is taking that information and using it for decision support. Uh, we look at things like, in my, in my laboratory, we look at things like climate effects, management, genetics or phenotypic responses, um, and other factors that may be really important for production systems. And a lot of this falls underneath this umbrella of food security, and I'll have some examples of that. Uh, for those who have not been to USDA in, in Beltsville, uh, this is kind of the, the scenic portion of the buildings right off of Route 1, and my office is kind of back here behind the tree. So if you guys ever want to come, you know where I am. Uh, so I'm using potato in this talk as kind of an illustrated crop, although we do many, many crops that have economic importance to the U.S. Uh, and, you know, I'd like to explain why. Um, so the U.S. is actually the fifth largest producer in terms of yield of potato in the world. So it's a very significant economic importance. Uh, of course, it does fall behind uh, as far as uh, edible crops for humans, uh, maize, soybean, rice, and wheat. But the knowledge also lags behind somewhat, for, somewhat compared to those crops, particularly how it's responding to these abiotic factors, so CO2 temperature and water. Uh, but again, it's such an important crop, we really need to get more of this information. Um, 
Like most crops that have a C3 biochemistry for photosynthesis, Cato has shown in a lot of my work and other work, we're seeing positive responses to CO2 enrichment. And we know through climate forecasts, we're expecting to see uh, higher CO2 levels as the years go by. Uh, but potato is also very drought and, and temperature sensitive. And if you look at most climate predictions, and I know many of you in the room are probably involved in doing some of this, uh, we know predictions involve not just CO2 enrichment, but higher temperatures, and a large extent, uh, water availability through reduced, reduced rainfall. And so you can't really study one of these factors without looking at the interactions of all three of these. And that's some of the data I'm going to be showing you. Um, and then potato also has tremendous genetic resources in the, in the U.S. and uh, actually, most of the world, we're using less than like 3% of the germplasm for the major cultivars of potato worldwide. So there's a tremendous resource that we can investigate to look at uh, ideal responses to these three factors. And ultimately, whether it's for potato or other crops, we really want to start using the knowledge that we have to help make decision support tools to help improve our food security, especially in times of climate impacts, but land uh, availability, rising population, um, and, and water scarcity. We really need to have better decision support tools to help plan our agricultural systems and adapt to these changes. So the first thing I'm going to focus on is, is kind of a summary of about 15 years I've done of, of experimental responses for potato. And this is just a summary, so there's lots of things I'm not going to show, but it kind of gives you a taste for what we're doing. Um, and you let, right, this is going to aggregate some of the responses for carbon dioxide and looking at interactions of CO2 and temperature and CO2 and water as well. And most of the data this talk is coming from is what we call our soil plant atmosphere research chambers. We call them SPAR chambers. I know a few of you had a chance to come visit us, and you're always welcome to come. And especially in the summer, you can see these in action. Uh, this is uh, a picture of one type of chamber. This happens to be corn, but we have plenty of pictures of potato also. Uh, what's really unique is these are outdoor chambers. So they are capturing the natural variation in sunlight that you'd see in the field. But they are sealed, so they can control temperature and carbon dioxide concentrations, water vapor. Uh, but because they're sealed, they're kind of this, we call this a semi-closed environment. And so whatever carbon dioxide the plant is fixing through photosynthesis, we have to re-inject to maintain the set point level. That re-injection of CO2 is an estimate of the photosynthetic rate of all the plants in these chambers. So it's a really unique set of information. We collect that every 30 seconds, average it to five minutes. And so we do one study, and every five minutes through something like potato, where you have a 120-day life cycle, every five minutes of that life cycle, you're getting photosynthetic rate non-destructively. It's a really unique, powerful set of information to give us an insight into the plant's physiology over time. And <clears throat> similar uh, reasoning applies. We can collect evapotranspiration as well. Uh, so that's kind of basically what I'll talk about here. Um, just kind of summarize the data that we're going to be going over. So we focus, and this is where this notion of different scales comes in. We focus on leaf level gas exchange or leaf level properties. So at the leaf level, we have photosynthetic rates and transpiration and, and stomatal conductance. But then these scale up to the canopy level. And so we do these both experimentally, but also in the modeling as well. And then uh, the other measurements that if you were to open up an agro agronomy journal, you're probably more familiar with things like uh, biomass over time, uh, yield, leaf area index, uh, leaf senescence rates, phenology, so the flowering, the onset of tuber initiation. Um, in corn, you'd have tasseling. And then we also look at the nitrogen contents in the tissue. This is all really important to look at how the plant is responding to, um, to the growth conditions that we're presenting to it. So the next couple slides, I'm going to summarize a lot of the data that we've been collecting. So this is looking at leaf level responses. On the x-axis, and we're going to see a lot of these, so the same description is going to apply. This is the relative increase from ambient CO2, which is about 400 parts per million for most of these studies. Um, so anything in a negative range would need to decrease from ambient. Obviously, the uh, right side of this would be an increase in response to ambient. And most of the studies were either at about 740 or 800 parts per million. So they're basically almost double ambient CO2 concentration. So this happened to be just from two of the experiments, but each, each experiment had multiple treatments. So this is leaf level photosynthetic rate. And I mentioned earlier that potato is a C3 crop, so we would expect to see a positive enhancement effect to, to carbon dioxide. And we see this. It's about, overall, about 16% on average increase over plants grown at ambient CO2. This is what we'd expect um, this type of crop. And similarly, we know when plants are exposed to elevated CO2, their stomates tend to close a bit. 
And so you see that kind of manifested in this uh, reduced to model conductance. Okay, and that's about a 27% decrease. So that would imply that at the leaf level, we're having better water use efficiency. You're having higher photosynthetic rates and reduced to model conductance, which would imply you have less transpiration from the leaf. And the, the question is, you know, can we really scale from leaf to canopy level? And the answer is you, you can. So this is a bit more complicated. This happens to be, uh, this slide is from one experiment, but I mentioned there will be a couple aggregated over more. So each of these, this is a, a four graph panel. And on the x-axis for each of these, each of these panels, it's a uh, light intensity for one day. So this is from zero to 2,000 micromoles of photosynthetically active radiation per meter squared per second. So instead of plotting versus time, I'm plotting versus par. And then you have, this is gross photosynthetic rate of all the plants in the canopy now. So we're not talking about leaf level, we're talking about the whole plant. And uh, these top two graphs, these are at 45 days after emergence, which was kind of right after tuber initiation. This was 20 days later. Uh, the bottom one is, these are the same dates, but these plants were only irrigated 25% of the water demand. So these were pretty droughted. The solid line here is the ambient CO2 response to increasing light intensity. And the, the dots are the measured values. And just to make it simple, we just drew some uh, lines through here. So this is the ambient response at day 45. The hash line is the elevated CO2 response. And so you, you see we are, in see we are indeed seeing an increase in the whole plant response to CO2 level, not just at the not just at the net leaf, excuse me, not just at the leaf level, but at the whole plant level. And this is persistent through different dates in the, in the growing season. And uh, in fact, at the highest par level, which is right about 100 in this case, it's about 14% increase on average. Okay, so we're seeing that it's persistent. It's not just we're seeing a higher CO2, a higher net photosynthetic response at leaf level, we're seeing at the whole canopy. And in fact, even if we look at the droughted situation, you're seeing that same pattern is persistent. Okay, so under Drought or fully irrigated, we're seeing a higher CO2 response to photosynthesis over the whole plant. But it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. So in a lot of cases, it's really difficult to draw direct parallels with leaf level to whole canopy, especially if you're making decision support tools. You have to take that into account. Uh, I mentioned transpiration. And this is actually now taking that same experiment. And instead of looking at uh, gross photosynthetic rate versus light, we're now just looking at transpiration rate versus hour of day during that same period. So again, this is, uh, this happens to be 45 days. This happens, happens to be the well water tr uh, treatment. So this is water use. And the open circles are the elevated, the closed are ambient. So you can see the water use is much less. This is transpiration rates. And the lines are just kind of regression lines we fit through to make it, make it easier. But so again, not only are we seeing higher gross photosynthetic rates, we're seeing reduced water, water use. And this is a 75% treatment of water. This is 50% of water demand. This is 25% of water demand. The take home message is you're seeing that persistent reduction in water use due to elevated CO2 occurring regardless of the drought level of the plant. And across all the treatments over 24 hours, it's about 80% reduction, uh, not just for this experiment, but others. Okay, so you have higher photosynthesis, photosynthesis and reduced. And then if you were to take the that kind of diurnal photosynthesis we looked at in the previous slide, two slides ago, and aggregate it up to each day. So you integrate it for each day and then plot it over time. You get these, instead of micromoles of CO2 per meter squared per second, we're looking at now the total amount of CO2 fixed per meter squared per day. So the x-axis here is days after emergence. The colored circles, again, these are ambient CO2 responses. The open is elevated. So not only are we getting higher you know, diurnal photosynthetic rates, but you see it's persistent throughout the whole season. So in our studies, we've never seen a reduction in that. A lot of times you'll read about photosynthetic acclimation, that the stimulus to uh, photosynthesis due to elevated CO2 tends to decline over time. We never saw that in most of our studies. And you can kind of see that that's persistent towards the end of the, end of the, end of the experiment. This, again, this was 100% irrigated, so these plants were not stressed at all. This is 25%. You see it made quite a big difference. This really was because of the water savings, that those plants really did not hit water stress. And they were growing at elevated CO2 to the same extent they were under ambient. So like Reika mentioned, the maintenance of this uh, kind of photosynthetic rate appears to be consistent with uh, elevated CO2 across leaf water stress and leaf and canopy scale.
So, and then if I was to aggregate all these responses, this is over eight different experiments now. Uh, again, you have this percent increase from ambient, and this is at the canopy level. So we measured uh, net photosynthetic rate prior to tuber initiation uh, as well as post tuber initiation. And in either case, you see that the, uh, the increase is about 7 to 9 percent due to elevated CO2 across the entire experiment. Again, if you remember that first slide I showed, we had about a 14 percent increase or 18 percent increase, I think, for, for leaf level. So it's not a one-to-one -one comparison, but it's persistent at the whole plant level throughout the season. Uh, ET was about 8 percent less. The water use was less. And because of that, because of the higher photosynthesis and less ET, you have higher water use efficiencies. So this, is, this was measured on the whole plant biomass. So this includes roots, shoots, leaves, and tubers. And that was about a 22 percent increase over ambient. And then uh, tuber response was about a 45 percent increase. So this looks great. You know, we know, we know potato is C3. It's going to respond positively to CO2. But we also know that temperature is projected to increase as well. And, oh, one thing before I get to that. So I, I didn't. Uh, not there yet. So this is a bio. So okay, this was uh, some of the gas exchange responses. This was the biomass. So sometimes too, a lot of the literature will say, well, the photosynthetic responses don't always equate to the actual dry matter in the plant. But what we're seeing here, it actually it actually does. So this was the total mass again aggregated over nine studies. It's about 19 percent, 18 percent higher uh, under elevated CO2, regardless of water uh, water availability. Uh, Holm is the above ground mass, so leaf and stem. That's uh, not much different, only about a 4 percent increase, which tells us most of that total increase went into the tubers. Okay, so that, that's actually a big deal because a lot of times if you get a response to elevated CO2, it doesn't necessarily mean you're allocating that carbon into the yield-bearing organs. Okay, so, so if it doesn't go into yield, it's not doing us much good, but in this case for potato it is. And that's about a 39 percent increase. And then the last thing, I'll, I'll go back to my comment before in a minute, we also looked at the phenology information. So for potato, we actually saw plants were shorter with elevated CO2, and that's actually reversed. For, for rice, we see the other opposite trend that plants are actually taller. This was kind of unique, unique to potato. Uh, but most of these other responses, except for leaf area, there wasn't much of an impact of elevated CO2. So the phenology of the plant, the progression through these developmental stages really didn't change because of higher CO2 levels. So that's important when you're trying to develop these decision support tools to understand the life cycle of the plant as well. So I mentioned that we know CO2 isn't just increasing. You have co-current increases in temperature. And so we have a bunch of experiments which we conducted looking at high CO, uh, different levels of temperature along with CO2. And so this is looking at two different varieties. Uh, on the x-axis, this, this is actually just yield we're looking at. On the x-axis is the average 24-hour temperature during the growing season. And then this is the total biomass in terms, or the, the yield biomass at the end of the season. So again, these closed circles are uh, the ambient response and the open is elevated. So in general, we're still seeing, as temperatures increase up to a middle point, we're seeing a higher CO2, res higher response to CO2. But as temperature starts to heat, heat up, that, that increase is starting to decline. And you really see this with a different cultivar. Okay, so as you start increasing temperature over an optimal level, which we are predicting for many agricultural productive regions in the US, that those higher temperatures tend to offset the CO2 response. And I have a modeling example where I'll show that as well. But you also see there's quite a bit of generic, uh, genetic uh, differences as well that need to be picked up by our decision support tools. Okay. So that's kind of a crash course in some of the experimental data that we've, we've gotten over you know, 16, 15 years of experiments with potato. But I want to talk about how we can take that information and use it to develop decision support tools. And that's where this concept of explanatory crop modeling comes into play. And uh, for those that haven't used uh, crop models, sometimes the easiest thing to explain it is using a picture. And uh, although this is sorghum, it's still the same concept. We're basically using the model to track what's happening from even pre-emergence all the way through the senescence of leaves and the development of the yield organs. So the model is basically run at every hour. <clears throat> and not only are they simulating the above ground mass and the development of the plant, they're also looking at what's happening in the soil. So we're looking at uh, root distribution in the soil, the water dynamics in the soil, the nutrient dynamics and how water and nutrients are being pulled from the soil, pulled up into the plant as the plant is aging and maturing. At the same time, you have kind of this progression through biomass increase, leaf area increase, uh, different developmental stages where you have flowering and then tasseling and the formation of, of ears or tubers or uh, panicles in rice. And so we're trying to capture all that with the model. Uh, 
Um, so when you start to do these more explanatory type systems, you need a lot more input data. You can have more accuracy, but you start to require more input. So things like meteorological variables, and I'll talk more about that in the next couple slides, temperature, solar radiation, relative humidity, wind speed, carbon dioxide concentration. Um, soil properties, we need soil texture, we need the different soil layers, the organic matter, pH, pretty much any property you can think about soils that would be important in agriculture, we need to have that information in our, in our database to run the models. Both of our parameters. This is really, and I showed you that slide where we had two different potato cultivars and they had a different response to higher temperatures in the CO2. And that's really important. We talk about model calibration. This is really what we're talking about, is identifying a set of values for these, these uh, cultivars that can then be used. If, if you develop a model for Maryland and you apply it for California, that same set of cultivar values should remain constant. If it's not, that's telling us we don't have enough science in the model. And that's a big part of what my lab is trying to reduce, is that uncertainty with the calibration process. And then, of course, management. So uh, when, the, when the crop was planted, how much was planted, what kind of fertilizer we added, what was the depth of planting, um, weeding, any kind of management the farmer's doing, we need to be able to duplicate in the model. And then the key output, of course, is yield, but we can track you know, long-term soil, soil uh, health, including organic matter changes and water holding capacity and nitrogen runoff and that, that sort of activity. So how do we do that? Uh, we kind of decompose that into different kind of uh, rates and state variables. And so this is kind of a, a just showing a, a partial list of all the rates and states in the model. But I, I just want to focus on kind of this gas exchange part. And so our models are focused initially on the leaf level, and we scale them up to the whole canopy. So if you were to look at this kind of photosynthetic rate, and I'm going to, I'm going to blow these up, but you can imagine that each of these boxes would have a whole set of equations and mathematics behind it. So I'm going to give an example of just a photosynthetic box. But you can see here, it's, it's clearly linked to uh, this is still model conductance, which is regulating both water vapor diffusion, but also the CO2 diffusion into the, into the leaf, into the uh, small cavity. But you also have boundary layer issues at the leaf surface that affect uh, the energetics of the leaf and the canopy. And the leaf temperature, intercellular CO2 concentration, this is all linked to water demand, which then propagates to soil availability and other uh, plant growth in the, in the uh, model. But this is all influenced by, like I mentioned, the, this is net radiation, the fraction of that which is uh, visible or photosynthetically active radiation. Again, air temperature, humidity, CO2, and wind speed, these all plug into the model. I'm going to show you how on the next couple slides. So this may be uh, a model that some of you are familiar with. This is the Farquhar model for leaf level photosynthesis. It's probably one of the more fundamental models that we have that's widely used in these type of uh, more sophisticated modeling applications. So what we're looking at is net photosynthetic rate on the y-axis. and we, we saw uh, a kind of summary of this in the first slide. But then this is the intercellular CO2 concentration. So this is the amount of CO2 that's actually in the stomatal uh, cavity that is available for, for, this, uh, for the photosynthetic, photosynthesis machinery. And if you were to get data experimentally, you kind of see this nonlinear response. As CO2 is increasing, the solid line here start to have this nonlinear, this tapering response. So what Farquhar realized is that this is actually can be controlled by three rate limiting steps. So you have the rate of rubisco, so it's actually catalyzing CO2 into the, into the plant. You have the light-based uh, regeneration rates, and then you have this triosphosphate utilization rate. So each of these steps has a whole set of different equations. And these equations themselves have equations behind them that look at the response of temperature, the response of nitrogen, or leaf physiological age. Uh, and that all requires experimental data and other, other lines of code that we're trying to parameterize. But how this will work is it's basically that solid line is basically the minimum of those three rate limiting steps. So where do we get the information for that? Oh, actually, hold off. I get So we actually, before I show you that, this is integrated with a stomatal conductance model. Uh, again, those of you who are familiar with uh, some of this work, this is the Balberry model. And this basically tells us that stomatal conductance, which we need to know in order we have to know what the CO2 supply is for photosynthesis, this is linearly related to net photosynthetic rate, humidity, and CO2 concentration. So now we're starting to see we've got two equations and multiple unknowns that we're going to have to solve simultaneously. And we then integrate this inside an energy balance at the leaf surface. And this is a linear form of the PEMIN model. And we, once we're able to solve for photosynthesis and small conductance, we can then use that to estimate transpiration rate. 
And so we have all kinds of algorithms that solve that. But what I wanted to show you is what this looks like while we're collecting some of this data. So I, I just showed you that kind of this, this ACI curve, which is what we call these plots here. This is work that we that I obtained experimentally for a couple different experiments, a couple different studies. So the, the open circles are observed values. The uh, solid is what we model now at that leaf level, photosynthesis, the model conductance, energy balance. And so in this case, it did, it did pretty good. And then we need to scale that to the whole canopy, which is another presentation, so I don't have too much information on that. But I wanted to show you, and I apologize, this is a little fuzzy. But I wanted to show you what that kind of looks like. So this is another experiment. This happened to be uh, each of these boxes is a different uh, air temperature. And then we have uh, hourly data. So, and on the y-axis is the whole canopy photosynthetic rate. So we've now scaled from the leaf to the whole canopy. And the solid circles are measured and the open is the simulated. And this line, by the way, is the, uh, the light intensity during that particular day. So you can see uh, 14 degrees, 10 degrees. I mentioned potato likes cold temperatures, so it's pretty happy here. 17, 12, 23, 18 is optimal for the varieties we looked at. But then you get the heat stress, 34 degree, which is real hot, right? The model kind of fell apart. The plant actually is, is giving us some, some data, but the model's not able to pick that up. And that's actually where the current trends are now today, is that most of these models have been developed using constant or very optimal temperature conditions, which were kind of held constant through the whole life cycle. But we know that we're more likely to experience these extreme heat events during really important developmental stages of the plant, like flowering. So right now, we need to improve the model to get this kind of information into it. So I'm kind of airing some dirty laundry, but this is actually where we need to go with the state of the art. And that's where both the experiments and also the modeling code is heading over the next couple of years. So that's kind of an example of how we've uh, <clears throat> kind of calibrating and validating for some of the the sub-algorithms in the model. But at the end of the day, we need to actually check this with field data. And in, in, our, in our area of expertise, there's been a lot of, um, uh, I'll say, comment about using indoor or using controlled environment data to build the model on. And so we always say that the controlled environment data, even though we have the chambers located outside, it's still, not, it's still an artificial environment. So you always have to ground truth it using real world data. The problem comes in, of course, when you have climate change, you can't really ground truth for that. So that's where you really want to have as much explanation in the model as you can, as, as possible, so you have more confidence in making predictions outside the data that you, that you uh, calibrated for. So this is just showing you that my team, we do collect our own field data. We also collaborate with a lot of different groups throughout the country and internationally to get field data that we can then use to calibrate and test the models. Um, this is just showing an example that I did in Maine. Uh, these are two different varieties. Actually, this is just only one variety for now, but this is a model. Uh, this is both observed, which is the x value. Nope, sorry. The solid value is observed, and then the x is the model. Uh, this is over time. This is uh, tuber yield. So especially by the end of the season, the model does a pretty good job of tracking it. This is nitrogen content in the leaves. Again, the model is doing a pretty good job. Uh, and then usually we have all kinds of metrics we use to kind of validate the model and ground truth it, make sure that it's good for the, the area that we're intending on using it for. And again, you've, you've kind of seen, oh, this is really fuzzy, but you've seen these kind of plots already where we compare, use that spar chamber data to look at the daily photosynthetic rate and make sure that the model's matching up as well. Okay, so I want to have a couple slides here now on uh, examples of what we're doing with the model. And uh, the first thing we need to do, although, although we, mostly scientists are using the models, but we also do want to get these in the hands of farmers. So we are in the process of de developing a new interface to kind of hide all that code behind people who don't really care about that. They just want to be able to look at what's going on in, in your field. And this is just showing you, you can, a farmer can come in or a consultant can come in and, and uh, enter the data they need to describe the soil and the management and the cultural conditions for their location. And then you can do kind of these what-if simulations. So this is showing, this is for U.S. farmers, of course, so the units are in ounces for plants. Uh, this is actually looking at daily photosynthetic rates. And these variations over time are because of light levels in the farmer's field. And then this is looking at tuber yield over time. Okay, so the question is, well, so what? What do you do with that? And that's what I want to talk uh, the next couple minutes on. You kind of, this is my conception for this. You, you have these models and what's behind them kind of in the middle here. We have a certain amount of inputs that, need, that are needed to drive the model and the outputs that you get. But what do you do with it? 
And so on the, on the kind of these boxes here, this run, are kind of showing some of the examples that we've done, and I'll highlight a few of these in the next couple of slides. But maybe the one that we're most familiar with today are these production forecasts. And the big thing is, well, you know, what's the effect of climate impacts on potato production? So you want to have a tool that's got enough science in it that you can get some comfort in extrapolating the model outside of the range of data it was developed for. I have a, an example of that. Uh, traditionally, this is one of the major reasons why the models were built, was looking at things like what was happening on farms. So yield gap was an issue. A lot of the yields starting to decrease over the years. And so we used our soybean model to show that, well, it was actually because the soil compaction was a big part, that over time, all the farmer having machinery kept going in and kept compacting the soil. And that was one reason why the um, yields have been dropping in this particular location. So you can actually start to use the model to understand what's happening physically on your farm. Another example, the farmers wanted to know if, they were, uh, if, they, if there was a way they could improve their water use. And this is uh, growers for soybean in Mississippi, and they realized by using the model that they were irrigating too late and too much into the season. And so they're able to save 10%, something on their cost because of water use saving using the model. Um, and then there's more things that I'm, you know, I'm also involved with this scientific inquiry. So we have some projects with, with rice we're going to be looking at uh, phenotyping, or we call it idio idiotyping. Are there better phenotypic traits that will confirm better resistance to heat stress or better uses of water use efficiency. Uh, you can use the model to help guide the bridging programs. We have a collaboration right now with the Dell Bumpers Group, which is part of USDA ARS in Arkansas, to look at some of these issues. Um, other cases, uh, are there other cultivars that are currently existing that are better suited for some environments than others? You can use this to model those types of questions instead of having to conduct experiments. So I'd say these three areas are kind of what we're most familiar with is using the models. Um, this box over here is a, these kind of geospatial food security questions, uh, which I think this group is probably involved in, and I'll show an example of that as well. Uh, this slide didn't come out as good as I wanted to, but we can also look at adaptation responses. A lot of these the studies have been looking at what is the impact of potential climate on food production. But we haven't looked as much on what the adaptation possibilities could be. And this is showing a simple, a simple case of where we just varied planting dates the different states in the U.S. to show how they could improve or result in decline in, in, in yield. You know, and then a big area now, which we're on a grant just started with, uh, looking at management and sustainability. This happened to be a cover crop group that we're involved with, trying to look at can we link these models with drones to get some real-time data to help growers kind of get a sense of in season what's happening with the cover crop, when do they need to kill it to plant the cash crop. Um, can they get a sense of how to better manage their, or what the yield predictions could be at the end of the season to get a sense of how to better manage their field? So this is kind of a big topic right now. We're starting to link drone imagery uh, into the models to get kind of real-time updates in season. So I mentioned uh, these production forecasts. And this was a, a paper that just got published. Oh, this is only a piece of that paper. But um, so again, there's a lot of information on the slide, but uh, what I want to point out is these are just two different varieties. Uh, they're different uh, decadal slices. So there are 30 years of weather years, 30 weather years run at each decade. And uh, this is for two different cultivars and two different locations. But the take-home message from this is we can look at different IPCC representative concentration pathway impacts uh, on potato or any crop you can imagine with, if we had the proper model. And this is not adapted right now. So we're looking at what the impacts would be. Of course, RCP 8.5 is more dramatic. I think it's about a, by the end of the century, it's about a four degree Celsius increase, I believe. And you can see, even though CO2 is rising, it, it can't offset the impacts of high temperature. Um, so that, that's just kind of one example of where you could do production level assessments. This one's a little bit more complicated, uh, but again, now this is looking more at a multi-factor assessment. Again, where we're looking at CO2 temperature and water. Uh, I don't know how many people have heard of the AgMIP project. It's a agricultural model intercomparison and improvement project, and I should know that because I've been leading the potato pilot for like ten years. But you kind of there's so many government acronyms I can't keep track of all these. But uh, just like in the climate ensemble world, when you look at the IPCC predictions, they're not being developed from one particular model. There's an ensemble of climate models that are being used, like 25 to 30 different models that are being used to generate these kind of likelihood predictions of changes in CO2 and temperature and rainfall. And so the crop modeling community has gotten together with this AgMIP project and are starting to look at the same thing. 
any given crop model, there may be 20 or even 30 different models throughout the world that are representing that, those models. And so modelers got together for the crops and decided we need to figure out how different or how similar our models are and why. <clears throat> and this is an example for potato. These are 10 different models that we, uh, we, we kind of average together to look at climate change responses in different production locations. So this slide is the easiest one to understand. It's a little more straightforward. But these are response surfaces. This is CO2 level on the y-axis. And this is changes in temperature on the x-axis. So this line here is uh, ambient condition. This happened to be for uh, locations in South America. Uh, and this would be plus 3 degrees, plus 6 degrees, plus 9 degrees. So as you would go from left to right at a given CO2 level, you can see that yields are starting to decline. These are percent decreases with respect to ambient levels. So high temperature, we're seeing a drop off in yield. Again, this is not adapted. But if we were to increase CO2 level, you kind of see the response surfaces are moving in this direction. That means there is some, um, there is some uh, fertility effect of CO2 to try to compensate for that elevated, elevated temperatures, but not enough. And regardless of the CO2 levels that we're using, even a three degree increase, you're still seeing significant decreases in yield. And then each of these boxes is a different uh, irrigation level that the growers can use. But the neat thing about this is you can imagine we can develop this kind of response surface for any location that's growing potato or any other crop. And so you can kind of get a sense of the vulnerability or the strength of that crop that changes in climate. And then you can start using those models to look at adaptation uh, responses to those. Uh, the other application, which is probably more familiar with uh, the group out here, is kind of these geospatial food security studies. Um, I may not say too much about this, but uh, we had been part of this large uh, grant. Uh, the initiation was this, with this was when, back in 2008, we had a huge spike in fuel, fuel prices. And food, food costs started going up, especially in the eastern seaboard. We import somewhere between 70 to 85 percent of our fresh fruits and vegetables. But despite that, there's still a lot of really good farmland in this area. Most of, its, most of our food, though, is coming from California, Mexico, and a few other countries. That created some food vulnerability issues that we wanted to apply the models to kind of address. So we gathered different databases for weather, for management, soil physical uh, characteristics. That land was currently being used. And then we kind of took these intersections of these different layers and applied this uh, modeling unit term where we could apply our models on to then get a sense of how much could be grown if we were to, to increase uh, the land availability in this region. So we used a couple different models to do this. I'm just going to show one of, the, one of the slides. This happens to be for potato. This was in the eastern seaboard. We looked from Maine down to Virginia. And these are aggregating the, the model responses to a county level. Okay, so these are megagrams per hectare of tuber yield. Uh, and the darker colors basically mean that you have higher yield. So this happens to be uh, rain fed production in this region. And these were all ground truth using USDA NAS data. And the bottom slides here are if, if we were to irrigate. Most of the potato production is actually water, is uh, rain fed. So this is more the typical case. And we looked at the mid-century climate impacts. Again, this is not adapted, but you can see the colors lighten up quite a bit. So as I mentioned, this is primarily because potato is a cooler season crop. And just a few degrees, you will knock off that plant from its optimum kind of temperature region down into its suboptimum. And that's what we're seeing with potato. And in fact, most crops. Uh, especially in Asia, you'll see they're being grown at their optimum levels. Just a one or two degree increase in temperature can really destabilize the production system. Um, but in this case, if we were to look at non-adapted, you have almost a 75% reduction in yield. This is a really worst case scenario. But if you, were to, if you were to irrigate more of these, it drops down to about 18%. And if you were to kind of irrigate where you really need it, it's about 50% loss. But this would tell us that you're really probably not that effective to grow potato in the region anymore. But other crops, like we looked at winter wheat, and that's actually got a positive response. So not everything is always negative. But what this does tell us is that you can use these type of models. <clears throat> and we looked at that type of study. You can use these type of models to look at if there are better crops that are more adapted to grow into a changing climate. Okay, that's another paper that we had, we had published a few years ago. On. OK, so I'm going to summarize all this and then have time for questions. So uh, that was basically kind of a. a a rapid walkthrough for what my laboratory does in Beltsville. And uh, you know, one of our big 
comments is that despite years and you know, hundreds of years of, of experiments being done on major crops, not just potato, but other crops, there's still a tremendous knowledge gap. In a large part, this is because most of the studies that are under controlled conditions have been done with constant factors. But we really need to start looking more at the interaction of factors. And like I mentioned, extreme conditions, like heavy flooding and very high temperatures just during critical uh, developmental periods are really crucial to understand. And we need the data, not just for the models, but for the growers to understand, should they be planting earlier or later in the season, uh, some basic things they can use to try to compensate for changes in, in the temperatures that they're already experiencing. Uh, I hope I've kind of made the point that the data really drives the testing of the hypotheses and the, the terms and the equations that we use in our models. And if you don't have good data, you're not going to have a good model. And if you don't have a good model, then making predictions is, is kind of, I don't say it's worthless, but sometimes it can cause more harm than good. So when you put more mechanism or more, more knowledge into those models, it requires more of that knowledge. So more science means more knowledge, but it also means more accuracy. That's another conversation we can have. Um, we do need to have some kind of tools, some mathematical tools to kind of quantify how to respond to impacts at different scales. Um, you know, most of the models that we focus are single, we call them point models, but I gave an example of where we're scaling these to larger, larger, reason, larger regions. If you were to use simpler models, the problem is that they don't have good grasp of uh, CO2 responses and the energetics that it has on leaf level temperature, which affects the model conductance, which affects water use. And so if you, use, if you use a simpler approach to simulate climate change impacts, you're missing half of the picture. That's why having more science into the models is really important. Um, and I didn't focus on this as much, but having good data is really important for modeling accuracy, not just for testing it, but also building it. Um, how you quantify it, how you, how you scale it up from different spatial and temporal, temporal, spatial and temporal scales is really important. Having good data is actually really hard to get. And, and it's, it's really crucial. And sometimes you can have the best model in the world, but if you have bad input data, you're not going to get good responses. And this is becoming an issue that we're seeing with the Agnet group, that we have really limited we think we've got this great data set from growers from 20 years ago, and it is. But then we realized, well, the soil conditions weren't described really well. And well, the management, this one farmer said he irrigated 1,000 millimeters. Well, that, that's not really possible. But we don't have a way of, of compensating for that. So that can make the model perform poorly if we don't have good data. Um, and, and just kind of reiterate, more, more mechanism in the models gives higher accuracy and better forecasting outside of data range that you develop the models for but it also has much steeper data requirements. So you really have to pick the tool that is suitable to the project that you're looking at. So I just want to end with uh, acknowledgments, acknowledgments of many people that were involved in the potato modeling part. And, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions now or, or offline as well. That changes. Uh, thank you very much for all this new information. <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to put two questions in one. I'm seeing the problem through the uh, point of view of uh, sub-seasonal to seasonal, <clears throat> meaning a few weeks to up to months. And so what time scales do you think that would be the most relevant to this kind of problems? And the, the second question in this ensemble of questions is, uh, what is the uh, sensitivity of your uh, model? to the uh, uncertainty of uh, atmospheric uh, variable input. For example, what's the sensitivity of uh, the yield, temperature, or to uh, short wave radiation, or to long wave radiation of the precipitation? OK, so the answer to the first question is going to be tough because I don't have a lot of experience in that. Um, <clears throat> my, from my background, you know, part of the issue that I see with the models is we, you know, we run those on an hourly basis so that we can capture Wild swings in daily, daily temperatures, rainfall, uh, cloud conditions, solar radiation. But if you're doing more seasonal, like broader term forecasts, you may not need that level of sensitivity, except that if you have like an extreme event that's going to impact your yield. So we know for rice, for example, um, something like five days of temperatures above 32 degrees Celsius, which is now happening down in the southeast of the US, that will negatively impact yield. So it, yeah, so if you don't have that sensitivity, you may be impacting your, your accuracy of your seasonal forecasting. So in general, I wouldn't think you need to have that uh, very precise or very high temporal scale. But if you're interested in kind of that extreme type of events, you may need it. Um, your second question, though, yeah, I mean, 
Response to the temperature and light, I mean, even a degree Celsius can have a pretty big impact, 10, 20% on yield, especially if it's happening during, during reproductive, reproductive ranges. So if, if you're familiar, familiar with the concept of cardinal temperatures, you may have a kind of this response to temperature, which is that vegetative growth, and then reproductive growth, growth could be something different. So most crops worldwide are being grown more at their optimum range, which makes sense. If you have one or two degrees above that point, you can start seeing this really sharp decline. So changes in atmospheric conditions can have a big effect. I mean, I think temperature is more crucial than solar radiation because that's really driving everything in the plant. The most difficult uh, variables is concentration. Yeah, and so, so most of my work, at least applying the model, has been on the eastern seaboard where we don't have an issue. But that actually brings up the point. I, I think, especially in the Midwest and West U.S., and most of the issues are going to be water availability. And I think it's something that tends to be overlooked by at least the popular press, that it's not just the rising CO2 and temperature. We're already seeing issues with water availability right now, especially aquifers draining. Um, so if you're growing a plant that's rain-fed, and we saw that with the potato predictions, if you're already reducing uh, water availability because precipitation, you're going to have a big problem. So the sensitivity kind of depends on where you are in the growth cycle. That can be a major effect. Yeah. Now let's ramp up and thanks to the speaker again.